Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, backing in with Matt Kelly for another episode of the award-winning Compliance into the Weeds. Welcome back from your Memorial Day holiday, Matt. Thank you, Tom. Good to be here. Did I opine that you had good weather? And if so, could you share it with the rest of the country? I, last week, was writing about Citigroup and their latest internal control headache. And Tom, if I recall correctly, this is at least the second podcast you and I have done over the years about Citigroup's errors. Citigroup was fined by British regulators for its subsidiary in London, its broker-dealer subsidiary, for weak internal controls that allowed a fat finger error. That is a term of art in a broker-dealer world, and it certainly is a very colorful one, where basically a Citigroup trader misentered a trade that he had wanted to execute on European stock exchanges, where he had wanted to sell $58 million worth of a certain basket of securities. Because he mistyped the wrong thing in the wrong field, he placed an order to sell $444 billion, with a B, worth of that securities. And Citigroup internal controls caught a lot of it, but not all of it. And this all happened back in uh, 2022, where they wound up accidentally selling $1.4 billion worth of securities, caused a flash crash on European stock markets for about 10 minutes uh, on a day in May. And now, finally, two years later, British regulators have faulted Citigroup for the poor internal controls that allowed that mess to happen. And they are paying, I think it's a total of about $78 million to two different British regulators Plus, Citigroup lost an extra $48 million on that bad trade. So this is a $126 million mistake in total that Citibank had, thanks to poor internal controls. Matt, as bad as everything you just described was, what intrigued me was not one, not two, not three, but I counted, I think, six or seven compliance lesson that you, lessons that you were able to identify in your blog post. So could may, we maybe go through those and try to tease out what compliance professionals need to look at in their program that we can learn from this FUBAR? I, I think we can, certainly. There's a lot of lessons to be learned here about the relation between the overall control environment at a company and the actual internal controls it is trying to build and operate. And we talk about the system of internal controls. We throw around words like control environment, control activities. We sometimes forget that these things are all part of a greater whole, and that really gets called out when you take a deep look at exactly what Citigroup did wrong here. So this all started, as I said, when a, it was, I think, May 2nd, it was in early May 2022, a trader wanted to sell $58 million worth of securities, and he put the wrong number in the wrong place. Instead of sending, selling $58 million worth of securities, he entered the $58 million in the units field. So he wanted to sell 58 million units of this security. And that's how the price of it went from $58 million to $444 million, or billion, I'm sorry. And he didn't catch that mistake. And then he pressed enter. So what happened after that? A couple of Citigroup's internal controls were automatic, hard controls, and they blocked a big portion of that order, $444 billion. Too big, the computer said, no way. And it knocked down $248 billion of that right away. The remaining $196 billion worth of that order was still going along, and it hit a set of soft controls, as the British regulators said, where a screen propped up on the trader's computer screen said, do you really want to place an order this big? We have a couple of automated red flags here you should review, dear trader. And it was a list of 711 individual warning messages that popped up on the day trader's screen. And like most normal humans, he was confronted with a big, long warning message on his screen. He just didn't read it and skipped all the way through down. He just clicked OK to make the thing go away. And he did not scroll down to the very bottom. He just clicked OK and made the whole message disappear. Now, what gets to me, Tom, is that you and I and everybody listening, we all know we have all done something similar. You have downloaded an app or you've opened a computer web page or something and a user license agreement pops up 
that is probably about as long as Moby Dick or War and Peace, and you don't read it. You just click OK. Or maybe, you know, you close it out or something like that. But nobody reads these things. It's human nature. And he did not read that soft block warning. So the 196 billion in trades go out. A few more trades uh, of them, a few more controls than catch that 196 billion that's still being processed. Ultimately, however, uh, 1.4 billion, I'm sorry, you got to get your numbers straight. There's a lot here. 1.4 billion of these trades were still executed on European stock exchanges throughout the whole continent. Caused a flash crash of roughly 4% of European stock markets went down when this order was processed. That is roughly equivalent to the Dow Jones average falling 1,500 points in the space of 20 minutes. That would be front page news. When this flash crash happened two years ago, it also was front page news. But I mean, it really speaks to poor control design. And Tom, what catches me now is that I've noticed for at least the last several years, Apple has sealed up this bad human habit of you just click through OK and you never read the user agreement. You can't do that with Apple downloads anymore. You actually have to scroll all the way down to the bottom of that mammoth user agreement, which I still don't read, but at least I've scrolled through it. And then I click OK, and then I go and I do whatever it is I want to do. If Apple could have figured that out for mere consumers several years ago, at least, as best I can recall, how come Citibank did not, or Citigroup did not anticipate that a trader might do the same? You know, he's going to present them with a list of 711 different individual warning messages. He's not going to read them. So why not compel the person to at least scroll page after page through 711 individual little warning red flag things that might have given a trader pause? Maybe I should take a closer look at this, but the control that they had designed didn't address any of that. The control was just, let's shoot up a list of 711. They're really only going to get to see about 12 or 13 on their computer screen. And then they just click OK and the whole thing goes away and the trade went out. So Tom, that was one big compliance lesson that struck me right away there is that when we're talking about the design of internal control, we really need to be thinking about human nature. What is the actual risk you are trying to address? And what is the business process you have and look at all of those things together. Because otherwise, if you're just throwing up a control that they can evade or go through right away without really understanding and pausing what is the risk, if you're just giving them a control that they can get out of, that is a compliance exercise that you're supposed to click an OK button. That's not enough. It didn't address the risk and it didn't think through how could we compel this user to actually look through what he's doing and realize maybe there's a mistake. And none of that happened. Then the trade went out and we can go from there. But that was probably the biggest lesson I saw. I actually took a different lesson from that, Matt. If you give, you said he didn't read it, I'm not sure he could have read it. If you give a trader 711 potential red flags or potential mistakes, or potential missteps, you're asking the individual trader to diagnose the problem and remedy it. It reminded me of the first time I had to put on FCPA training and the monitor had prepared a 248 page PowerPoint slide deck that took 7.5 hours to go through. It was written by lawyers for lawyers. It was absolutely ridiculous. No guy on the shop floor, one cared, or two probably could have interpreted the cases that I wasn't talk, talking about. Here you've given a trader, you made a mistake, you made a potential mistake, and here are 711 potential mistakes you should evaluate before you make this trade. I'm not sure you could ask a trader to do that, even with as much training as I assume they get. Even if he could have read it, I'm not sure that he could have implemented it. And so my question is, the soft control identified A or some red flags. Why didn't it pop up with the A or some red flags that had been violated? Why wasn't the control more focused? You could have 711 potential red flags, but give the user 
the red flags that he has either raised or violated so that he can attempt to remedy that. In addition to everything else you said, as a fellow stroller or scroller through the Apple um, contracts as and user agreements as well, but there was a couple of other things that really struck me about your blog post, which was the failure of the human element or the human in the loop, as I've learned the phrase is in AI, and the interaction of technology and humans. You want to uh, maybe lay that out for us as well? I, I will, although I do want to pick up, I think you raised a fair point about would anybody look at 711 individual red flags? Probably not. Would anybody want to go through a 248 slide PowerPoint deck? I mean, God help the masochist who would like to do that. But you could at least have a conversation when the control slows down the business process that might be a mistake. And, you know, if you had a 248 pay deck, a 248 slide PowerPoint deck and said, nobody can leave the room until you click through each one of these slides. I suspect the client, the board, the CEO, will all say, we have better things to do with our time. Are you crazy? But they are talking about what is really going wrong here. You've got them engaged. And this soft control was deliberately designed to be able to skip all of that. Here's the long list. Do you want to read it or do you just want to click OK and go through to your next step? That was the mistake. And I do think that, you know, so long as internal control designers and business process owners are sitting there thinking about what could we really do to make people pay attention to the risk instead of just getting them to do the thing that shows they've complied with the step, that's the conversation you need to have. Now, back to the human element here, because, okay, so our trader did click through the 711 warnings. He missed that. The $1.4 billion in trades were ultimately dumped onto the European stock exchanges. But it is a fair question to ask, shouldn't somebody else at Citigroup have noticed this? Yes, they should have. And unfortunately, due to a series of odd circumstances, the wrong people were not looking at it at the wrong times. Here's what really happened is that this trade was executed on a banking holiday in the United Kingdom where the trader was. So the team that would normally monitor unusual trades generated by internal employees, that team had the day off because it was a holiday. So the backup team was one that normally would monitor externally placed trades from, I guess, a Citigroup customer or something like that. So they did receive an alert that this huge trade was going out and some of the automated controls are blocking it, but not all. Does a human want to look at this? And that second group didn't actually look at it. There was, in fact, a third monitoring group at Citigroup. They did notice this unusual trade, but A, they didn't notice it for 35 minutes, which is a lifetime in modern trading. And in fact, it was 20 minutes after the original trader did notice his mistake and said, oh, crap, I need to try and cancel this. I mean, it had already gone out the window at that point, but the trader eventually noticed it. This third backup monitoring team also noticed it. They tried to escalate to the regular monitoring team, which had its day off. So it went to the secondary monitoring team who never replied. So that is lesson number two here is that really Citigroup just didn't have enough staff. This is a $126 million mistake because they did not have enough staff in sheer numbers. They did not have enough staff who were trained to know what to do. And that reflects your control environment. You know, the control environment ultimately is there to make sure that risk is managed properly. And when concerns are raised, they get addressed in a prompt manner. The CEO, the head of compliance, the head of risk management, the board, the head of internal audit, they're all tasked with things like, are we hiring enough people? Are we hiring the best people we possibly can? Are we implementing the best systems? Have we tested this system? And that wasn't happening to a sufficient degree at Citigroup, which, by the way, is one of the largest banks in the world. And they certainly do have the resources to at least think about these issues and try to address them. But the issues were not getting addressed. Now, you could also say, oh, go ahead, Tom. 
And once again, I actually saw a little bit different angle. In addition to everything you said, I don't think companies think about the calendar as a risk. I don't think they think about the days of the week as a risk. And here we had a trade made on a British banking holiday. They have their own little holiday system in Britain. It's well established every quarter or so there's a bank holiday, but the rest of the world doesn't celebrate. And so you have British bank regulators or monitors in this case, who have the, the day or the weekend off. And here I'm reminded of when North Korea stole about a hundred billion dollars from Bangladesh and they stole it out of the New York feds bank of Bangladesh account by sending the appropriate SWIFT code on a Wednesday night. Bangladesh's weekend is Thursday and Friday when the New York fed sent 35 faxes to Bangladesh asking for confirmation. Not one was responded to. And then when Bangladesh got back to work on Saturday and tried to contact the New York Fed, guess what? It was the weekend here. So we had two more days where there was no response and the, the wire went through. Now they got back about $13 billion of that, $100 billion. But I don't think people think enough about either the calendar or a day of a week as a risk. And normally you might say, you know, we're going to have a skeleton staff because it's our holiday. We just had Memorial Day. We've got July 4th coming up. Uh, I'm sure there's reduced staffs for banks because they're closed here in the United States. What happens in England or you, in, in the EU? I think it's just, for me, brought up a wider remit of what is risk. But I know I interrupted you because we've got even more. I do want to say, I think that's an excellent point about the mundane ways that risk can manifest. And I am not saying that banks should have a battalion of humans on the clock, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Although that may not be a bad idea, given the nonstop business of global capital markets anymore. But you could think through. If we're going to be on a day off and we don't have enough staff, maybe we should have stronger automated blocking controls instead of the piecemeal approach that Citibank wound up using, or Citigroup rather. So that is another good demonstration of the real issue I'm trying to raise here is that banks and all other companies need to sit back and think really hard and creatively, probably with multiple people in your enterprise about what is the real risk we are trying to manage? How would it actually happen at a business process that we have and we use? Therefore, what makes the most sense for a good set of internal controls to adjust and uh, block that risk? Now, Tom, just to make this even a bit more just mind numbing here, it turns out that Citigroup actually did have a strong set of hard blocking controls to prevent these sort of oversized trades, mistaken trades that then cause flash crashes. But they only had those hard block controls for its New York trading desk, which had implemented them in 2013, and not for the European trading desk when this flash crash happened in 2022. They have since implemented the controls now and that, you know, the cooperation from Citigroup did lead to, I think it was a 30% discount on potential penalties from the UK regulators. They did praise Citigroup for the remediation and cooperation after the fact, but that still doesn't really address the shortcomings and the lack of creativity and urgency around internal controls before this flash crash happened in Europe. And we should remember that this is the same Citigroup, which in 20, uh, I think it was 2020, paid $400 million to the Feds, the U.S. Fed, for poor oversight of internal controls. And back then, four years ago, the U.S. Fed put Citigroup on a work plan to improve its internal controls. And here we are. Two years after that, they had the flash crash. Four years later, we're still sip sifting through the remnants of this internal control failure. This is the same Citigroup that accidentally wired $900 million of its own money to Revlon on behalf of creditors that were Citibank customers. Citibank basically accidentally paid off a loan to Revlon by mistake and then couldn't get the money back 
because under New York law, there was some quirk that basically if a bank messes up, a bank's responsible for it. And that took years of litigation to be able to claw back some of that money. And there were internal audits at Citigroup that had been flagging poor internal controls on its trading desk, at least as far back as 2018. So when we talk about a culture of compliance, when we talk about strong internal controls, one of the best metrics to look at are internal audit findings that are unaddressed because that means senior management has not yet leaned on the operating divisions to say, why have you not fixed this yet? Internal audit flag this, go and fix it, go and fix it now. And those kind of conversations apparently did not happen at Citigroup or they did not happen with the necessary urgency because internal audit was flagging it in 2018. They had the Revlon mess, which I think happened at the end of the 2010s. They had the Citigroup fine with the U.S. Federal Reserve in 2020. And here we are four years later, and we are still sifting through this lack of ability to get internal controls where they need to be. I will give credit to their CEO, Jane Frazier. She has said that fixing internal controls should be a priority at the bank, but all evidence to the contrary, because we have had several major failures and several internal audits that have made this a known issue for at least six or seven years. And here we still are. You have to wonder, is Citigroup too big to manage? Is there a lack of urgency in the control environment, in the corporate culture, in the leadership? Is there something else wrong here? But that really is the big lesson for all of this, is how you, a company, could think through applying the right urgency to your internal controls to make sure that you have the right ones, you have them working. When they are not working, you get them addressed in a prompt manner. None of that is happening here, according to the uh, settlement documents we have from our UK regulators. And I'd like to tease out another lesson for compliance professionals from your last point, because you're very articulately set up Citibank had actually identified the risk and put control in place to manage the risk in New York. Where they failed to do so was outside the United States. And that really drives home for me the message that the controls you have in the United States, your delegation of authority for managers in the United States is very different or can be very different from that outside the United States. As you know, I grew up in the energy industry. Outside the United States, country managers were near God's status. They had almost unlimited authority within their countries. And there may be some top dollar amount that they could contract for. But if you don't have, if you've identified a risk inside the United States, you better have managed that risk outside the United States. And if you've left it to your country manager or the country internal controls and have different controls, because of something like this business unit was an acquisition, so they have a different ERP system, you're setting yourself up for this type of failure. So you have to have consistency in your management of risk once you've identified it literally across the world. After having listened to you for now 24 plus minutes, I think there are more lessons learned than I thought when I read it, but this is just chock full of uh, lessons for every compliance professional that we've gone through. Any real final thoughts you want to leave our audience with? I would just say, I do think you raised a good point about implementing a sort of global perspective and understanding of what your internal controls are. I can appreciate that sometimes that's easier said than done for a global business. You might have local laws and regulations that constrain you in some ways and some markets. A, I don't think that's true for global banking because Citigroup has been one of the largest banks in the world for many years now, at least the last 15 years or so. And B, to a certain extent, the risk doesn't care. The risk doesn't care that you have inherited an ERP system from an acquisition that makes it difficult to meld your internal controls. The risk doesn't care that it's happening in London rather than New York or Singapore or Tokyo. And that really is where you need to go. We often say in ethics and compliance, you need to meet employees where they are. There's an analog to that for internal controls is you have to meet the risk where it is. And in this case, the risk of somebody just making the simple mistake, putting the number 58 million in the wrong field, and then clicking through a big, scary user warning on their computer screen, 
anybody could make that mistake anywhere in the world. And that is not a novel idea. You really do need to think through how is that risk going to manifest full stop. Don't care where it is. Don't care why. Don't care what day of the week it is or if it's a holiday. You have to make that risk, understand where it is, how it's going to happen, and what is a good, sensible control. Unfortunately, Citigroup came up a bit short, and now it is paying a painful uh, price for that mistake. Matt, I can't wait to see what next week brings us. Thank you, Tom.